Pregabalin is a gabapentinoid medication. It has anticonvulsant, anxiolytic, and pain-relieving effects. Because of those properties, it's been prescribed for partial seizures, neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, anxiety, and other conditions. It also has some recreational potential, with effects like sedation, euphoria, and increased sociability. There's been a lot of interest in widely using pregabalin because it has a fast onset, low drug-drug interaction potential, a fairly good safety profile, and the ability to improve sleep. However, the opposing argument is that physicians should be more careful with their prescribing due to its recreational potential. One of its greatest uses is in neuropathic pain, including diabetic peripheral neuropathy, post-herpetic neuralgia, and central neuropathic pain. It begins working within a week and is most effective at 200 to 600 milligrams per day. Along with improving pain, it can also improve comorbid issues like anxiety, depression, and insomnia. It has a very similar activity to gabapentin, though there may be a trend towards higher efficacy and greater side effects with pregabalin. Reviews of its efficacy have shown it's better than placebo and can be treated as a first-line treatment. In epilepsy, pregabalin is used as an add-on treatment. That means it's given in cases where a patient's existing medications aren't sufficient. The substance can further reduce the frequency of partial seizures. As a single therapy, it could also have some efficacy, but it may be less effective than lamotrigine and topiramate. Overall, there's some evidence that levetiracetam may be a better add-on drug than pregabalin, though both are effective. Pregabalin can improve pain and sleep in fibromyalgia, with a less reliable and significant impact on fatigue. For generalized anxiety, disorder, it might be a good option for some people. It's more effective than placebo and has the benefit of working faster than SSRIs and SNRIs. Around 200 to 600 milligrams per day is most effective, though we don't have enough evidence to tell if it should be a first-line treatment. Some evidence indicates it offers similar psychic anxiety reductions to SSRIs and potentially greater somatic symptom reductions. There's less research regarding social anxiety, but it could be effective for that condition. Condition. A bit of research has looked at its impact on post-operative pain. Some research has found providing pregabalin before an operation can reduce opioid usage and pain, but there's conflicting evidence in this area. Sometimes there's no significant effect, and sometimes it only reduces opioid use. For people who are dependent on drugs like alcohol, benzodiazepines, and opioids, pregabalin might be helpful. Some evidence suggests it can reduce withdrawal symptoms and even reduce craving. There is conflicting evidence evidence, though, with some reports finding no significant effect. Across conditions, pregabalin has a beneficial impact on sleep. In both healthy and treatment populations, the drug increases slow-wave sleep and may also reduce the time it takes to fall asleep. Since it reduces wake time after sleep onset and the number of awakenings, its strongest beneficial effect is on sleep maintenance rather than sleep induction. Other conditions where it might be helpful include restless leg syndrome, PTSD, depression, bipolar disorder, and certain types of pain. Most of the adverse effects from pregabalin are mild in medical settings. Dizziness and drowsiness impact a large minority of patients, though they appear to decline over time and may be dose-dependent. Drowsiness is one of the top reasons for discontinuation. Most of its adverse effects are basically the same as those from gabapentin. Some of the other potential negatives include dry mouth, edema, ataxia, blurred vision, and confusion or distress disturbed attention. Weight gain is another side effect that, although only affecting a minority of patients, can be problematic. Some people will experience more than a 7% weight gain. Cognitive and psychomotor performance aren't significantly impaired. Even though self-reported concentration and attention might be affected, pregabalin doesn't greatly impair daytime functioning. Up to 450 milligrams in a day doesn't seem to affect reaction time or vigilance. Any of the negative effects that do do exist, like sedation and impaired attention, tend to decline with extended use. The overall cognitive effects are lower than what's seen with benzodiazepines.
Outside of treatment populations, and often with higher doses, pregabalin is taken for recreational reasons. While someone with a prescription may use 600 milligrams over the course of a day, 600 milligrams with a single administration is a common recreational dose. Plus, without a tolerance, the impact of that dose is even greater for a recreational user. While the recreational aspects are dose-dependent, patients also sometimes report euphoria, a floaty fever, anxiety reduction, and mental stimulation. Some people transition from medical to recreational use as a result, but a lot of users don't get any clearly positive effects until they take a common dose. It's described as having similarities to alcohol and GHB, and is often said to be more enjoyable than benzodiazepines. This is because it has a notable euphoric quality, pro-social activity, and can even be somewhat intactogenic. The positives include euphoria, color enhancement, mood lift, sedation, music enhancement, analgesia, muscle relaxation, anxiolysis, light to moderate intactogen effects, light to moderate dissociation, physical euphoria, and increased self-confidence. Among the negatives are dizziness, drowsiness, impaired motor control, cognitive impairment, and nausea. Amnesia or forgetfulness can occur, but it's not a major issue with pregabalin at common doses, and muscle twitches are another positive possible negative. They don't really show up in medical settings, yet some recreational users do report them. Despite being classified as a CNS depressant, the sedation from pregabalin is a little complex. People often find they're mentally stimulated and actually feel more motivated, yet this comes without the physical stimulation of a regular stimulant. Unless a very large dose is used, pregabalin usually won't make you overwhelmingly tired, so it can help people get more done with the added benefit of a positive, calm, carefree, and sociable mood. A dissociative quality can also appear, though not to nearly the same degree as a regular dissociative. That kind of effect can facilitate daydreaming and contribute to anxiety reduction. When a euphoric dose is taken, the euphoria can be pretty strong, placing it on a level akin to alcohol or GHB, rather than benzodiazepines. And the light to moderate intactogen effects include feeling more empathetic, more appreciative of the self, than others, and more interested in talking. Pregabalin can also potentiate the effects of opioids, alcohol, and benzodiazepines, though that's not necessarily a good thing from a safety perspective, and it's best to avoid combining CNS depressants. Combining them could increase the risk of amnesia, losing consciousness, impairment, and possibly respiratory depression. Some users report positive effects when combining a common pregabalin dose with psychedelics or MDMA, which is similar to how some people use phenibut. It might increase the chance of a positive mood and reduce anxiety. Although the onset should be 30 to 60 minutes, a lot of people report a delay. If you're using it for recreational purposes, it might take 1.5 to 2.5 hours to really become apparent. The drug's effects are most prominent for 6 to 10 hours, but a high feeling and positive afterglow can persist for another 5 hours or more. Usually, pregabalin does not lead to a hangover. Instead, positive after effects are more common, but you might feel drowsy and experience motor control impairment until the effects are fully gone. Pregabalin is a derivative of GABA and a member of the gabapentinoid class. It's the S isomer of 3 isobutyl GABA. The three position substitution allows for uptake through amino acid transporters and binding to a calcium channel subunit. Compared to other three position GABA analogs, it is likely more potent for pharmacokinetic reasons. The isobutyl addition appears to play a role in transport, which could make sense since the large neutral amino acid transport order, LAT, also lets leucine into the brain. Leucine is 2-isobutylglycine. Despite being designed as a GABA derivative, pregabalin lacks GABA-related effects. It's inactive at GABA-A and GABA-B receptors, and it doesn't operate through the benzodiazepine receptor. Despite some potential for raising GABA by altering glutamate decarboxylase, it appears that activity requires supratherapeutic doses. We can basically treat pregabalin's pharmacology as being independent from direct GABA activity, though over time, it could 
could increase GABA uptake by shifting the distribution of the GABA transporter. Most of its pharmacology appears connected to binding at the alpha-2 delta subunit of voltage-dependent calcium channels. This means it's pretty similar to gabapentin, though it has a superior bioavailability and is more potent. Binding at alpha-2 delta could reduce the release of excitatory neurotransmitters such as glutamate, substance P, and possibly norepinephrine. It does this by reducing the presynaptic neuronal influx of calcium. There are at least four related subtypes of the alpha-2 delta protein, types 1, 2, 3, and 4. Of those, 1 and 2 have basically the same amino acid sequence, while types 3 and 4 are a little different. Only types 1 and 2 bind pregabalin with a high affinity. The binding site for the substance is heterogeneously distributed and appears at a high density in the posterior gray column and forebrain. Unlike other calcium channel blockers, it primarily affects neuronal activity. As a result, it usually doesn't alter cardiovascular function. Along with reducing excitatory neurotransmitter release, alpha-2 delta binding may exert a medically useful antisynaptogenic effect. This is because it can inhibit the action of thrombospondin, a prosynaptogenic signal. Therefore, it could block abnormal synaptic arrangements and inhibit the formation of excitatory synapses. Pregabalin has a Tmax of 1 to 1.5 hours and a half-life of around 6 hours. It has a nearly complete bioavailability when used orally. And unlike gabapentin, it exerts linear kinetics over a range of 75 to 900 milligrams. Only minor metabolism exists, with over 90% of pregabalin being excreted unchanged. Food doesn't reduce drug exposure, but it does delay the rate of absorption. Impaired renal function can significantly impact pregabalin's pharmacokinetics, so you must lower the dose. Medically, pregabalin is most often used at 150 to 600 milligrams per day. Typically, it's started at around 150 milligrams per day, split into two or three doses. The dose is increased on a weekly basis until an ideal response is obtained. In non-medical settings, a light dose is 150 to 300 milligrams, a common dose is 300 to 600 milligrams, and a strong dose is 600 to 900 milligrams. Although some people people report using more than a gram, the safety of that kind of use isn't known. Drowsiness and other negatives are significantly more prominent at higher doses, and the recreational effects don't drastically increase. As such, you should stick with a common dose in most cases and avoid surpassing a strong dose. In 1988, Richard Silverman at Northwestern University asked a visiting scholar from Poland to synthesize a series of three alkyl GABA and three alkyl glutamate drugs. He wanted to investigate their inhibition of GABA aminotransferase and glutamate decarboxylase. An unexpected finding during the testing was that they activated glutamate decarboxylase instead of inhibiting it. This was a novel mechanism of action. Silverman immediately responded by having them tested for anticonvulsant activity. By 1989, an invention disclosure was submitted to the Northwestern University Technology Transfer Program. Companies were contacted about utilizing the new drugs and their unique mechanism of action. Only two responded positively, Upjohn and Park Davis. Upjohn only wanted to use the compound that seemed most effective, while Park Davis looked at the entire series. In terms of glutamate decarboxylase activity, the R isomer of 3-methyl gas was most effective, so that's what Upjohn chose. When it was tested on mice, it only had weak anticonvulsant properties, so Upjohn discontinued his research into the series. In 1990, Park Davis called Silverman to invite him to a seminar to discuss the compounds further. It turned out 3-isobutyl GABA, not 3-methyl GABA, was actually the best anticonvulsant in the series. The S isomer, which would become pregabalin, was determined to be a very effective anti anti-seizure drug in animals. As a result, a license agreement was signed between Northwestern University and Warner Lambert, the parent company of Park Davis, and a patent application was submitted. During the early 1990s, animal experiments took place, followed by years of toxicology testing at Park Davis. New syntheses were developed to produce larger amounts of S3 isobutyl GABA. Park Davis submitted an investigational new drug filing in 1995, allowing 
allowing human testing to occur. Phase 1 clinical trials lasted for a couple years, and Phase 2 and 3 trials occurred from 1999 to 2003. Those trials covered thousands of patients with epilepsy, neuropathic pain, and anxiety. During that time, Pfizer acquired Warner-Lambert, which gave it exclusive rights to continue developing pregabalin. An interesting side note is that you would have expected Upjohn to have greatly regretted its decision. Had it tested more than 3-methylgaba, it may have ended up with a blockbuster drug in its possession. However, shortly after Pfizer acquired Warner-Lambert, it also acquired Upjohn. So, the drug likely would have ended up with Pfizer regardless. Pregabalin entered the European market in 2004, initially for neuropathic pain and then for partial epilepsy. The FDA approved pregabalin for neuropathic pain in December 2004, enabling it to enter the US market in 2005. It was also placed in Schedule 5 by the DEA due to its potential to cause euphoria and other positive psychological effects. Because it did not substitute for benzodiazepines in animals and because the recreational effects appeared to decline over time, pregabalin avoided Schedule 4. During its first full year of sales in 2006, pregabalin made Pfizer $1.2 billion. Northwestern initially received a royalty of 6% of net sales, and a quarter of that went to the team responsible for the drug's creation. That deal has proven to be very helpful for Northwestern. The university made $700 million in 2007 when it sold the rights to around half of its royalties. Because Northwestern continued to bring in money, additional rights were sold, and the money was invested in the endowment, it ended up with over $1.4 billion from the drug. To this day, pre-Gabalin royalties are responsible for a large portion of Northwestern's endowment. Over time, the drug has been approved for more conditions, and prescriptions have become significantly more common. Europe approved it for anxiety in 2006, the FDA approved it for fibromyalgia in 2007, and it also ended up being approved for central neuropathic pain. In 2015, Pfizer generated $4.8 billion from the drug. Pregabalin is Schedule 5 in the U.S. In most countries, it's a prescription-only drug rather than a controlled substance. Even significant overdoses of pregabalin typically aren't fatal on their own, though a fatal response cannot be ruled out. An overdose could lead to severe drowsiness, impaired motor control, coma, and potentially cardiac abnormalities and respiratory depression. There are multiple cases of people surviving multiple grams of the substance, though someone with a pre-existing vulnerability could conceivably have a severely dangerous response from a dose other people have survived. While you should never take an overdose, pregabalin does have a pretty good therapeutic ratio. It's most dangerous when combined with other CNS depressants, such as alcohol, benzodiazepines, and opioids, if you're using recreational amounts. There are some atypical responses to pregabalin that can show up even at medical doses, including hepatotoxicity and heart failure. Both are very rare, with cardiac issues appearing to be somewhat more common than hepatic issues. For this reason, it should especially especially be approached with caution if someone has a pre-existing cardiovascular issue. Pregabalin seems to have a higher connection to cardiovascular issues than gabapentin, possibly due to more potent calcium channel antagonism. It's been rarely associated with conduction disorders, arrhythmia, palpitations, heart failure, and myocardial infarction. A safety warning is in place for the anti-epileptic class, including pregabalin, regarding a potentially higher risk of suicide. It's possible the drug could lead to a slightly higher rate of suicidal ideation, but the link is still being investigated. While tolerance isn't a major issue in medical settings, it develops quickly in recreational settings, according to user reports. Within a couple uses, the effects decline significantly. This can lead to people using thousands of milligrams per day. To avoid this, you should not take the drug often or at doses above the common range. Withdrawal also isn't severe in medical settings, although tapering is still recommended. Recreational users who are highly dependent report major withdrawal symptoms including nausea, insomnia, headache, anxiety, agitation, sweating, and a sick flu-like feeling. 
More information is available on the Drug Classroom website using the link below. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments, and you can also email me with questions. The Drug Classroom is only funded by donations, so if you want to support, please do so on Patreon.